another gospel, brethren. I was thankful for that introduction because I actually had a brother come up and say, you better not be preaching another gospel. Well, I assure you I'm not. <laughs> but this is what we're dealing with in this text, another gospel. You've heard a lot of the gospel of Jesus Christ today in a matter of ways, and there's only one true gospel, right? There's one gospel that God works through. But what, however, what Paul finds here is that the people who had once heard that same gospel you heard started listening to someone else. And we're seeing the, seeing the consequences of that, to giving your ear to the voice of another other than the one who saved you. Now Paul says he, he marvels at the fact this happened. These people, they heard the gospel of Christ and they had a good start. It says they begun in the spirit, had a good start, a valid start. But they went from having a good start to falling, falling from grace. Now that is one bad transition. Begun in the spirit, fallen from grace. Apparently there was a lot of focus on law in the Galatian church which is why Paul had to draw their attention to the accomplishments of Jesus Christ and what the impact those accomplishments have on men. It had to be emphasized the law was not a means for men to be made righteous, but rather it was faith in Christ Jesus. That's what makes men righteous. But just the same, this is a strange occurrence you're reading about here, a very bizarre situation. Paul says he marvels, not that he expected it, right? He didn't expect it. He didn't have a hunch this was going to happen. He says, he, I marvel. Yeah. So the versions say this. They say, I'm surprised. Or here about this way. says, I'm shocked. Like this, There's like an alarm about this expression. I marvel. Another one says, I wonder. Or I'm amazed. And one says, I can't believe your fickleness. I can't believe it. It's like it just he's trying to wrap his mind around it. Like this? You've given in to this? This is what you took? You had this and now you have this? I marvel. Have you ever had that kind of a reaction to something that you were confronted with? Has anything turned out so differently than what you expected that that was your response? Like, I'm shocked. That wasn't what I saw coming. Or perhaps something was going a certain way and then things changed abruptly. And people are like, well, they have this expression. They say, what in the world just happened? It's shock, bewilderment. Well, here's an example of like, kind of like a shocking thing. What if Brother Given O. Blakely came up here and said, I'm an atheist. What would your reaction to that be? You'd be shocked, wouldn't you? That's not something you'd expect him to say or any of the other brethren here. But that's kind of the sense of, that's the kind of thing unfolding here in this letter, what Paul's dealing with. The fruit Paul was seeing produced by this church certainly was not the fruit he expected to see, considering they began good and in, in the spirit. This church hadn't been around for just a couple minutes. It had been around long enough, apparently, to have gained some considerable ground. So there's, like, there's some time lapse here, and so there's, there's room for growth here. And so rather than seeing that growth, you see something completely different. These people started out like you, receiving the gospel word with joy and gladness. But the question is, why did they decrease instead of increase? I tell you, it's not the fault of the gospel. It's the fault of another gospel. Amen. Think of you, some of you have had people work on your house. What if you hired a carpenters to like, let's say, work on, build a house for you. The work starting, you leave and months later, you come back and they haven't even set up walls yet. What would you think of that? That's it. You'd think there'd be more work done than that by then. There's, there's an expected progress when someone's yeah. growing in the faith. Yeah. That so much so it's kind of bizarre when people aren't growing. Likewise, it was strange to Paul that a church who responded so favorably to the gospel of Jesus Christ would be in such poor condition after hearing it. Yeah. It's interesting to note, though, that believers in the scriptures that are in the state are not treated as the norm. Paul didn't treat this as normal. In fact, he said, I, don't, I didn't even expect this to happen. Now, that's not the case today. It seems today this is what Christians are expected to be like today. Backslidden, slothful, lazy, what have you people may not come out and say that, but this casual attitude about a divided and weak church just echoes that loud and clear. But Paul didn't have that mindset. He didn't. He wasn't casual about this. I mean, just imagine all of you who have been here year after year coming back, hearing the word preached or even preaching the word. If I came up to any of you and said, you're still in the faith? I thought you'd be gone by now. You lasted this long? Wow, Brother Al's still believing? Wow. What, now, what if I did that? Wouldn't that be kind of inappropriate? 
Wouldn't that seem kind of strange if I were to act that way? Now, the brethren in the book of Hebrews, they're told they're dull of hearing. Remember that? He said, you've become dull of hearing. These are people who heard the gospel too. Had a good start. You've become dull of hearing. They lost something that they previously had. And it's interesting to note that everyone's dull of hearing when they're distracted. Not only that, these people were not able to handle meat. The Hebrews, I mean. They weren't able to handle meat. They still had to stick to that milk. Milk is for babies, not meat. As far as this writer was concerned, they're like full-grown adults sucking on baby bottles. This is strange. That's why I'm building a case here. This is not, this is weird. There's something not right here. What if any of you saw me sitting at that table sucking on a baby bottle? What would you think of that? I already know what some of you would be saying in your head. Aren't you a little old for that? You, what's wrong with that guy? He must have a medical condition. That's what probably people would think if they saw that. That's, see what I mean? It's bizarre. That's not the norm. That's not normal for people to act that way. Likewise, how strange is it for anyone to see a Christian not growing in their faith or not producing good fruit and to think nothing of it or treat it as normal? The examples could go on and on, but you get the point there. The thing is, this condition is inexcusable in the light of the gospel. The condition of the Galatian brethren was so, it was inexcusable in the eyes of Paul. There was no valid reason for this happening. This did not have to happen. He was, he was so, this had such an impact on him that he opens the third chapter saying, Oh, foolish Galatians. That sounds kind of harsh. Perhaps one of the more modern translations will put that more gently. Shall we? Look? Let's look at some of those. Here's how one put it. You stupid Galatians. Yeah, a version of the Bible says that, which is what foolish means, but that's what it says. The other one says, Galatians, deficient in understanding. They also use words like thoughtless, senseless, and the message says, you crazy Galatians. You've lost your minds. Again, wrap in the mind, you've like, something's, something's wiggled loose here. This is not normal. What in the world could you have been thinking to embrace that? Crazy, thoughtless, senseless. He follows this up by saying, like, who has bewitched you? Like, put another, put, like, put a spell on you. That's almost like a way of saying, like, snap out of it. Get out of this thinking. But why would he speak to the Galatians this way? It's because they had the real thing at one point. And what they had initially was way better than what they had at the time this letter was written. Amen. They downgraded. They were as Esau who traded his birthright for a pot of stew. Amen. And I imagine it wasn't a very big bowl. Be like, what good is this birthright if I die? All right, I'm better now. That's pretty much what Esau did. He exaggerated his circumstance. These people had gone from living by faith to living under a system of law and regulation. I mean, don't we see a lot of programs like this today? How to this, step by step that, rules and systems, how to live godly, how to make God happy, make your life here earlier, or even programs how to cease from sinful activity. But that kind of thing is what prompted this question from the Apostle Paul when he said, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect in the flesh? Is this how spiritual maturity is gained? Spiritual maturity will never result from a man-made system, ever. If the origin is the flesh, it will cause spiritual life to wither away. Amen. It's a very dangerous thing to go back to a lost system after coming to Christ. The law was a schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. That's what it was designed to do. For someone to go back to it as a means of righteousness after becoming a saint of the Most High, it's like that kid who can't swim trying to push his mother away in the water saying, I can do it all by myself. Not knowing as soon as she releases him, he sinks to the bottom and drowns. What's the difference? There really isn't. The focus of salvation is not human effort. It's Jesus Christ who put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of God where he serves as intercessor, mediator, and king. Now, Paul, when he mentions they were removed, he's like, soon, soon removed, like already? Like, I thought you'd last longer than this. I thought you'd go way beyond this. But he says, you're so soon removed. He makes known this gospel, it's not another. Remember he says that? Which is not another. That is, it's not a gospel that yields the same fruit as what he preached to them. It's a gospel of a different order. 
one with a different focus and a different message. Hearing this gospel resulted in them being removed from, his, removed from him who called them into his grace. That is, it caused them to make a departure from the God that called them. This made them leave God rather than draw them to God. They went backward instead of forward. The gospel they heard was actually a perversion. He said, remember, there's some among you that trouble you that would actually pervert the gospel of Christ. It was a perversion of what they originally heard. Now think about it. What is a perversion of something? It is corrupting something that was at one time good, taking something beautiful and making it disgusting, taking something that's right and making it wrong. That's what it means to pervert something. Somehow the gospel they heard got changed into something else. Someone mishandled that, shaped it around. Just like the devil in the Garden of Eden, he perverted the word of God by saying, you shall not surely die if you eat that fruit. He perverted it. He turned it into something that killed him. A very serious matter, so serious that Paul tells us this. He says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than what that which was preached unto you, let him be accursed. He follows up by saying, as, I, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have not received, let him be accursed. You notice he repeats that point. And he repeats it on the account of its importance. If an angel or man preaches a message contrary to the gospel, let him be accursed. That is, let him be doomed to destruction or misery. That's what that means. It doesn't matter even if an angel pops out of the sky and says something to you. If, it, if that angel says something that contradicts what, what the gospel, what the apostle said, you don't believe that angel. Isn't it interesting we got two major religions that are founded on an angel? Sorry, Joseph Smith, that angel's accursed. You should not have listened to him, assuming he did talk to an angel. Or Muhammad, he did the same thing. An angel spoke to me. Well, apparently that angel was accursed because it didn't line up with what the apostle said. That's what Paul said. It doesn't matter if it's an angel. I don't, matter, I don't care if you have a vision and said, God spoke to me in a dream. If that dream says something contrary to the word, it's not from God. Amen. Let him be accursed. Whoever said it, whoever started this thing. Now the statement though, he says, if any man preach, remember? That tells you exactly how this contrary gospel got into their midst. It was preached. It was proclaimed. Paul said there were some that troubled the brethren. And he even says later in the book that, that whoever started up that trouble is going to bear his judgment. Remember that? He's not getting away with this. Woe to that man, whoever he is. So this would mean someone got in who wasn't of the fold of God. False teachers crept in unawares, as Jude would put it, and preached a false message to the Galatians and ended up practically undoing the work of the apostle Paul. That's how devastating this was. It almost undid his work. The Galatians were in such bad shape as a result of false teaching that Paul came around and said, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. It was as if he feared that they had become so perverted from the gospel that his pains and labor put into their conversion was all just thrown away. That was a genuine concern he had. But let's note, this was not done by accident. This perverting of the gospel, this was not an accident. Men, unfortunately, have a lot of loose and flimsy ideas of what a false teacher is. And I'm talking with the scriptural definition in mind. Men who preach this message, they intentionally perverted the gospel. You don't pervert the gospel by accident. That's purposeful. And preached with the intention of leading men away from Jesus. It looks like they succeeded to a extent, but it's a crafty strategy. The way such teachers tried to get men away from Jesus, they cocked up a message that claims to be straight from the heavens with Jesus not at the center of it. It could be just simple as that. Just omit Jesus from the message. Now it's not gospel. Jesus is the gospel. How could you leave him out and have a gospel? Well, apparently Jesus was not at the center anymore of this message. A message that's more focused on the appetites and wants of men than that of God. I gather this was a focus because Paul said, Am I? he asked this question, he said, do I seek to please men or do I seek to please God? And ask me, that's a good question any minister should ask before they go into any field of ministry for God. Who am I here to please? Am I here to make you happy or am I here to make God happy? 
Who am I here to please? Where are my priorities here? A false gospel won't nurture the new creation, but it'll sound really good to the flesh. You notice that? Fleshly people, worldly people drawn, they're drawn to something that appeals to the, appeals to the flesh. People don't like what's on, why not change the channel, right? Did not Paul warn Timothy of times where men would not endure sound doctrine, but rather they would have itching ears? Now, a crowd with itching ears, that's fresh bait for a false teacher. Yeah. Fresh bait. It's practically an open door with a welcome mat saying, come on in and give us what we want. Yeah. Welcome. Now, Peter said, Te false teachers, they're wells without water. Now, that's a perfect example if you think about it. I mean, if you're in a dry and thirsty land, you see a well, that's something to be happy about, right? Well, I'm dying of thirst. A well, yes. So what happens if you dump that bucket into the well and it's just as bone dry coming out as it was when it went in. That's false advertising, isn't it? This is a well. It's supposed to have water. Why isn't there water in this bucket? It's a well. Wells without water. It's false advertising in a very real sense. False, likewise, false teachers. Okay, we're not talking misguided people with sincere hearts here. No. That's not. False teachers never used, like otherwise Apollos is a false teacher, which he wasn't called, by the way. He just needed some direction. Some people they can just undo with just some direction. That's it. Yeah. All right, well, here. We'll show them the way of the world more perfectly. We'll show them the scriptures, and then they're like, oh, well, I see it now. Well, that's not the kind of people we're dealing with here. We're not talking about misguided, sincere hearts. Not at all. False teachers are fakes. Pretenders. Imposters, deceivers, actors. That's what they are in scripture. Hypocrites. They're not the true servants of God. They weren't sent by God. However, they come claiming that God spoke to them. And the Galatians fell hook, line, and sinker for it. Now you may hear about Jesus and the Holy Ghost and the purpose of God in another gospel, but here's the problem. Another gospel means another God. Another spirit. Another Jesus. It's not the true Jesus if it's another gospel. False Christ that Jesus warned about, he said, false, many false Christs will rise and deceive many. Remember that? A lot of them come in the form of a message. They come right here from behind the pulpit. From the mouths of men. Paul spoke to the Corinthians about a possible someone coming after him and preaching another Jesus that they haven't heard, that he didn't preach. So men are doing this. They are preaching another Jesus. But this to me makes it very evident that if men don't know Jesus, they're going to get swept away with false teaching. That's like an advantage they have. The less you know, the more advantage they have. We have to be aware men are preaching messages that are not from God. Not just for our own sakes, but for the sakes of others who seek God as well. The question at this point is, how do we know when another gospel has been preached? Look at the fruit of what's being preached. That's exactly what Paul did. He looked at the fruit. On another note, Paul, Paul knew what the message he preached would produce. He knew the gospel. He knew what this generated. And so when he saw what was going on at Galatia, he knew something was wrong because that didn't come from his message. Amen. Someone else has been talking to them. And so he takes care to instruct them. He preached Christ to them, but they'd slipped back into a system of bondage. Now, I will say this does show how absurd it is to be casual about false gospels being preached. Paul didn't take this line down. He, didn't, he jumped right on that. He labored extensively to bring these brethren right, right back into right standing with God. People are too dismissive about this. He didn't sit back and be like, they'll come around. You ever people say that? They'll come around. Laziness. hate that saying. These people didn't come around. He had to instruct them. But then again, on another note, he didn't throw his hands up and say, well, what's the use? I did all I could. There's nothing I can do now. I give up. Sorry, Galatia. You had your chance. He didn't do this either. See, there's two extremes to that. There's a casual, and then there's just people will just cut him off altogether. But Paul was demonstrating the very nature of God and not being willing that these people perish. Isn't that a, isn't that a characteristic of God? Not willing that men perish? Amen. Well, you see that demonstrated right here. He's not content with them just going off off the edge of the cliff, he's going to take some, some kind of move to 
help restore them to what, where they were. That shows the nature of God. He knew they had the real thing at one point, but now they'd settled for something far lesser in value. So he's going to bring Christ back at the forefront of their thinking. That's what he's going to do now. Let's bring Christ back. Let's get him back at the top where he belongs. So that they might see the absurdity of the false gospel that they had given into. This teaches us not to give up on those who stumble, but rather to take effort to retrieve those who have been led astray, although it must be done with a great deal of caution, sobriety, and understanding. You can't go into this kind of thing with guns blazing, lest you make a bigger mess than what's already been made. So there is care here to do this, but it can be done, should a man have the right mindset going into it. Now at this point, it's necessary to bring in the true gospel of Jesus Christ. At some point, Paul emphasized Christ in his letter here. Faith in Christ, he brought that up. This wasn't like a beat down letter. Oh, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. He's bringing up things to help bring them back. At some point, he spoke of liberty in Christ. Remember that? Stand fast in the liberty where Christ makes you free. He brought that, in this same letter, he brings that up. At some point, he spoke about walking in the spirit so that you might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. To these same people, the fruit of the spirit is brought up also. Now, all false teachers are out there. There's real ones out there too, right? You've been hearing them all day. There's real teachers out there too. Let's not neglect that. Men who do preach the word of God, they're out there. Jesus is the one who makes men free from sin. It is faith in Christ that justifies men and gives us access to the Father in heaven. God has told us in the gospel record what the good news is. It's the message that men can be freed from the bondage of sin. That sin that weighed down on you for so long, that could be forgiven. Now that's joyous to someone who's weighed down by sin. That could be forgiven and cast into the sea of forgetfulness. You don't have to be, like some people, they'll talk like they're still in their old state. They're like, I'm a filthy, rotten sinner. Well, you know, you don't have to be that. Christ makes people new creatures. Amen. And a new creature isn't rotting. Amen. Jesus is so precious that when men hear about him, they forsake everything they have to follow him. I'm talking about when people hear about the real Jesus. Yeah, people, they'll leave their house. And they'll even walk away from anyone who might hinder them, even if it's a family member, if they hear about the real Jesus Christ. Jesus can com com completely transform how a man lives his life in this world. So much so they're like, they're called a shining light. They stand out. That's what Jesus makes men, sinful men. He can turn them into that. Jesus didn't die to produce something that was offensive to God. He didn't die to produce what these Galatian brethren had become. And sometimes that has to be brought up in our message. Like, this is not what Jesus died to produce. That's not a product for the death of Jesus. This can't stay this way. Where some people are going in life, it's not a product of the sacrifice of God's Son. So let's take heed not to dishonor the Son in how we operate as an assembly. Amen. Let's not operate in such a way where Paul would want to speak to us in the same way he did to these Galatian brethren if he were still alive. Amen. But there's the thing here. The state the Galatians here are in, that can be avoided. All of this right here that you read, this state, this doesn't have to happen to any of us. This is from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, 21 through 23. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, praise God, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If, if, you hear that? If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard. You've heard the gospel message of Christ. Now stay grounded in it. The Galatians, they didn't do this, but you can. You can do what they didn't do. That's something somewhat positive you can take from these corrective letters. They're corrective to the ones that the letter's being written to, but they can be preventive to us. By observing what happened here at Galatia, we can see to it that it's never said about any of us. We see how God feels about that now. We see what apostle feels about that. We saw how absurd that is. So we could just take from that, and we'll just set our minds, we're just not going to be that. And God will give you grace to do that. However, part of the problem in Galatia is that the message got changed. So this shows that the gospel must continue to be preached, but it can't be allowed to be tampered with by anyone. 
cannot tamper with the gospel of Christ. It has to be preached as it is in the scriptures. I feel that part of the issue at Galatia was that the environment made way for false teachers to enter in. However, such people have a difficult time intruding and sneaking in where faith is strong and growing like a tree. You notice that? When people really are taking hold and growing and getting strong, it's harder for fakes to get in when the body's operating the way it should. That kind of environment actually discourages people like that from coming in. You notice I'm talking about insincere people, people who don't care, people who want to cause them to They're not drawn to a holy environment. Their intentions to contaminate, so they're not drawn to holiness. So that, let's make a resolve that we're going to be that kind of assembly that drives away hypocrisy, insincerity, and worldliness, where people feel uncomfortable being that way here. We can do that, or continue, I should say. So keep proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, just as it is in the scriptures. Who said it better than Jesus did? Or the Holy Spirit? Knowing that if any man change it, it's no longer something that leads men to Christ. That's how critical it is to just leave it as it is. You change it, it's not going to lead people to Jesus. It will, though, if you say it the way God presented it. Take that from this as well. There's only one gospel that God works through. No others. You don't preach the gospel, then you don't get the results that come with it. You don't get it from another system. You don't get it from another man. You get it from God. Brethren, I rejoice at the continuous proclamation of the gospel of Christ, to hear a message of his love and his truth, and his mercy, and his promise of eternal life. I rejoice at every recollection of that. That message got me in, it'll keep me in as well. By God's grace. So I end tonight by exhorting you, stand fast in that liberty where Christ makes men free. Don't be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Something you can take from this is by holding on to what is true, it'll keep you from embracing what's a lie. They had to let go of the truth. They had to let go of the real gospel to embrace the false one. But you keep hold of the truth, you won't embrace the lie. In fact, it'll help, make, it'll help you hate the lie even more. It really will. So don't let go of that gospel message, lest a man come and pervert it like it was at Galatia. I hope as the gospel is opened up in many different aspects from here on, that some or even many will come to experience the working of the Lord through those messages, as we've prayed many times leading up and during this meeting. I'll conclude there, but I could say, it's no, I'm glad that Brother Al's speaking after me because of his topic. This is a good follow-up. You heard the devastation of a false gospel, but now he's going to elaborate on the real gospel that the Galatians should have held to. So I say, what are he saying? Hold on to that. <laughs>